doorstop <laughs> is volume two. It is not necessary to have read volume one to buy volume two. Uh, <laughs> not like Lord of the Rings, you didn't have to read the Fellowship of Ronald Reagan to turn it on. <laughs> but I, I guess I should explain uh, why someone, I should begin, I suppose, by explaining why someone would spend the better part of a decade uh, doing something as egregiously uncommercial as doing a multi volume history of this dimension. Uh, partly I thought, you know, why should Paul Johnson have all the fun writing doorstop books? Someone else should try to enter the lists. Um, uh, and there's other reasons besides. Before I get to that, though, I, uh, I will mention that the volume one, a lot of people missed for a very simple reason. It was published on September 10th, 2001. So I was on the East Coast for a media tour, which needless to say didn't happen. Uh, although it got very good print reviews. Uh, and so I thought, volume two, I was keeping my fingers crossed. It came out August 25th. And I was keeping my fingers crossed, uh, not only for myself, but obviously you, know, you don't want to be superstitious and think something uh, terrible will happen to your country again. And I was booked for my the, on launch day to be on the Morning Joe show on MSNBC. And interesting that MSNBC picked me up rather than going to Fox uh, shows, but that, you know, who knows. Um, so I got to New York and went to my hotel and checked in at the front counter, and they handed me my room key, and it was room 911. So I thought, no, it couldn't possibly be. There's just no way it could happen again. So the, the next morning, I get up about 6 for uh, to be picked up at 7 to go to the studio. And I turn on MS, MSC to see you know, how to get warmed up and all, get in the flow of the show. And there I see the news that Ted Kennedy has died overnight. <clears throat> and I look at my cell phone, and sure enough, I'm canceled for the day because they're going to do Ted Kennedy wall to wall. And I start to think, well, jeepers, uh, it's not 9-11, but it <laughs> seemed to be kind of snake bit. So they rebooked me for a couple days later, whereupon I sent out an email to all my friends saying, please pray for the health of Robert Byrd. <laughs> <laughs> and it went off without a hitch a couple days later. <laughs> Still, you do wonder about these things. Um, uh, I set out to write copiously about, uh, on a sort of a wide perspective of Ronald Reagan for a couple of reasons. One was, uh, I want to be a little careful about this, but I, I was lucky enough to attend a small dinner with Edmund Morris in the summer of 1993, which was five or six years before his biography came out. And he's a very talented writer, uh, but it did strike me uh, that he was approaching Reagan too narrowly. He was interested overwhelmingly in Reagan's personality and aspects of what he was like, which is interesting and important, but I heard nothing from him about Reagan's politics, and we'd ask him questions, and it, it occurred to me that he wasn't terribly interested in politics, which it turns out is true. Morris is not really interested in American politics. And so I had a premonition that the book would be unsatisfying in a lot of ways. Um, I didn't think it would be as peculiar as it turned out to be, but that's another story. So I thought that there was going to be room for uh, other work on Reagan, uh, that would put him in a broader political context, get more of the backdrop, because I think Reagan is uh, more interesting for his political story than his personal story. Um, that's true of a lot of people in politics, I think. Uh, and I also thought, when Reagan left office 20 years ago now, that the most likely outcome was that he would be Coolidgeized. <laughs> and if you remember Calvin Coolidge, he left office uh, in 1929, quite popular with the American people, but within a generation had been rendered into something of a laughing stock uh, after the rough handling of mostly partisan historians. And it looked like the same thing would happen to Ronald Reagan, right? We were still heard the stories that he was the amiable dunce of Park Clifford's great phrase and so forth. So I thought that there needed to be uh, you know, a reasoned defense of Reagan done. And in, in the late 90s, even uh, you know, as uh, recently as the late 90s, partly because they thought Morris had the monopoly, no one was doing a lot of work on Reagan. <clears throat> Although people were starting to at that time, uh, I thought that the field was open for someone to really try and do it on a wide scale. Well, over the last decade, something quite surprising and unexpected happened. And that is that liberals started to like Reagan. Uh, and his reputation started to soar. Now, the liberals didn't like all of him, to be sure. Um, uh, and at the same time, I think a lot of conservatives tended to become overly sentimental about Reagan and see him through a gauzy, almost romantic or superficial lens uh, that I think uh, needs some correcting. So what I finally arrived at is what I think is some revisions that cut both ways. 
some revisions against uh, the uh, conservative narrative, and some corrections, I would say, of the liberal narrative that has grown up around Reagan. The, the liberal writers who once scorned Reagan but now like him, uh, people like John Patrick Diggins or Richard Reeves, um, even Sean Bolletz to some extent, and, and Doug Brinkley, uh, they admire him mostly for the Cold War story. Uh, they've come to acknowledge uh, 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 the centrality of his role in that, um, which for a time, remember, Gorbachev alone was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Because I, I think the uh, line is no Republican presidents are eligible. Seems to be the standard out in Norway these days. Um, <laughs> Uh, and for most of those historians, uh, this is not true of Diggins, but it's true of all the others, um, Reagan's domestic policy is still a train wreck at best. They think his economic policy was wrong-headed. Uh, they think the Iran-Contra uh, disaster uh, uh, you know, represented uh, you know, corruption or worse. Um, and so the rest of uh, Reagan's presidency is regarded as dubious. And you see this, uh, it's the theme of just about every other Paul Krugman column these days, is that Reaganomics was responsible for Bernie Madoff or something like that. Uh, but I think that this disjunction between Reagan's Cold War statecraft and his domestic statecraft is a major interpretive mistake. And above all, I think too many of these liberal treatments of Reagan try to abstract him from his ideology, which is, I'd like to say, uh, borrowing a phrase from G.K. Chesterton, is like trying to tell the story of a saint without mentioning God. Uh, I think that um, among the revisions in, in my book is trying to reestablish the unity of Reagan's foreign and domestic statecraft, and that you need to evaluate them together. Uh, I think that Reagan had a central idea that guided him in both foreign and domestic policy, and the central idea in one sentence is the view that unlimited government, unlimited government, is hostile to individual liberty, both in its vicious forms, like totalitarianism, but also in its supposedly benign forms, like big government bureaucracy. In other words, Reagan regarded what today we call statism, I guess called it then too. He regarded it as a continuum rather than a separate phenomenon. And in fact, he used almost that language uh, in his famous speech in 1982 in Westminster in London, where he put it this way, <clears throat> quote, there is a threat posed to human freedom by the enormous power of the modern state. History teaches the dangers of government that overreaches, political control taking precedence over free economic growth, secret police, mindless bureaucracy, all combining to stifle individual excellence and personal freedom. Close quote. Notice the conflation there of secret police and mindless bureaucracy. And he, he goes on to make clear that this is not a coincidence or not merely an accident of the speechwriter. Tony Dolan, the principal author of this speech, although Reagan wrote lots of insertions in the speech in his own hand. The next sentence he said this, Now I'm aware that among us here and throughout Europe, there is legitimate disagreement over the extent to which the public sector should play a role in a nation's economy and life. Here I pause mid-sentence to say, this is another way of him saying, I know you aren't all as freedom-loving as me and Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> I think is what he's saying. But to continue the quote, but on one point all of us are united, our abhorrence of dictatorship in all its forms. I should add, by the way, that that speech was quite controversial when he gave it. This is the one where he said it was communism that would end up on the ash heap of history, that even now its last sad chapters are beginning to be written. It occasioned lots of uh, critical commentary in the American press. The following day he gave a speech in Bonn to the Bundestag that was entirely conventional, the NATO alliance has been around for 30 years and may it last forever, and you know, it, it had none of this kind of elements that he gave in the speech of London, which I thought was quite telling. Now, one of the problems of trying to write about Reagan's whole story as a unity, and as I, I try and tell a lot more about the domestic policy story in my book than a lot of the books about Reagan, many good books by conservatives about the Cold War story, but even conservatives have tended to neglect the domestic policy story, but it's a much harder story to tell because it's more diffuse. It, it encompasses a wider range of issues, uh, and it had more mixed results. The full report card on Reagan shows some wins, some losses, and a lot of ties, <clears throat> and a lot of things left undetermined still to our own day. And above all, from a narrative point of view, it lacks the drama of the Cold War and those dramatic summits with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. 